Mike Radich here, and I'm now joining the phone by Olympic gold medalist and World Cup champion, Lori Kalupny. Lori, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Sure, no problem. Thanks for doing it. Lori, on July 30th, your former team, the Chicago Red Stars, will be retiring your number 17. What does the Red Stars organization mean to you, and how much does it mean to you to have your number retired by the team? It's a real honor. I mean, to, to tell you the truth, when I look back at my career, um, probably my favorite playing years were the years that I was playing in Chicago. Um, just the you know the coaching staff, the administration there, and my teammates. Uh, we really grew so close, um, and and like I said, it's really some of my my fondest playing memories and, and some of my favorite playing years. So uh, the Red Stars organization it means so much to me, and and uh, I'm really excited that that my number will go down uh, in history for the club, um, and you know to kind of have that on it is really cool. Now I'm sure you knew this day was coming when the Red Stars would retire your number. Because you're a legend of the sport, and for many years you were such a key contributor to the organization, so you had to have known this day was coming. But were you a little surprised at how quickly it happened? Because, after all, you haven't even been retired a year. (laughs) Yeah, it's been only a couple months, really, that I've been away from the game. But, um, I mean, really it wasn't something uh, that I... It it wasn't just a a natural thing for for me to have happen. Uh, I don't think they've retired any jerseys uh, in the past that I'm aware of. Um, So it wasn't, I didn't really know that it was even a possibility. Uh, When they contacted me a couple weeks, a couple months ago about doing this, I was kind of, I mean, I I was kind of taken aback and and, um, really just kind of shocked and, and honored. Technically, you're the third player in the history of the NWSL to have their number retired. I say technically because Leslie Osborne she never played for the Boston Breakers when they were in the NWSL. She played for the Boston Breakers when they were in WPS, but since she got her number retired last year, she's in that group. But really, it's just you and Lauren Holiday as the only players in the history of the NWSL to have their number retired by the team they played for. So you're going to be making a little bit of history on July 30th. Who from the team called you and gave you the good news? Um, I talked to the general manager, Elise LaHue, uh, who, you know, we've kind of uh, grown to be good friends over the years. So she was the one that kind of broke the news and let me know that that was going to be happening. And um, so, uh, yeah, I- I'm pretty excited. And, and like I said, I just, it's just such a huge honor. It's really cool. On July 30th, besides the team retiring your number, will anything else be going on? Will you be doing a signing or a meet and greet at the game? What will that day consist of for you? Uh, yeah, I'll be there with a bunch of families coming down um, to support me, and uh, I'll be there for, for meet and greet, autographs, um, all kinds of things. That I, I even hear that the, the World Cup trophy might even make an appearance that day as well. So uh, so it'll be a fun day and uh, especially um, fun for myself and something that I'll never forget. Why number 17? <laughs> well, I... Uh, number seven was always my favorite number, like, growing up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I started wearing 17 in college, and that just kind of became my number. Um, so I was number 17 on the national team for a long time um, until uh, I was, you know, I was off the national team for about five years there, and then Tobin swooped in and took my number. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, so I was number 17 always on the Red Stars, and that's kind of, you know, I, I'm not a big number person, but it, number 17 does have uh, some uh, significance to me. During your absence from the national team, a few players wore the number 17. Even Abby Wambach wore the number 17 at one point in time. Tobin Heath took over the number at the 2011 Algarve Cup and has worn that number ever since. But I'm interested in knowing, how come when you returned to the national team, you didn't take that number back? Because I can't imagine... Tobin Heath caring a whole lot about numbers because, after all, she wore number 98 in college. So I'm just curious, why didn't you take that number back? Um, well, to tell you the truth, I could have taken it back and, and Tobin offered to give it back, but I felt like, um, you know, she had earned it. She had earned it. She had, that was her number. 
Uh, and I had been gone for five years, and, you know, that I think um, for me it was about just getting back on the team and, and finding a new place and a new, uh, a new way to help. So I, I didn't want to go back on, on history. I wanted to kind of move forward. Uh, and Tobin, I mean, if there's any player on the team that, that I would want to have my number after me, it would be Tobin because she's a, a I mean, just a world-class player but an awesome teammate and a great friend. I've always been curious about that because it was very strange for me to see you wear number 16 because for as long as I've been watching, you've always been number 17. So it was very strange for me to see you not be 17 anymore. And on a side note, I recently found my 2007 U.S. Women's National Team World Cup bobblehead collection, and I have one of yours and I saw that number 17, and I was like, okay, this feels right. Do you remember those bobbleheads? Do you have any of those? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got some. My, my, I think my, my family probably bought out all the 17s. <laughs> we have, like, a bunch of them hanging around the house. But, mm-hmm. but those are pretty cool. Yeah, they're great. I bought them off eBay, like, six or seven years ago, loose. But they're in great shape. I, I really like those things a lot. And I thought I lost them years ago but three days ago i was cleaning out my room and i found them and i picked up yours and i was like this is a sign from the gods that we have to do this interview (laughs) yes exactly (laughs) how closely do you follow the red stars and the nwsl do you watch a lot of games yeah i watch um uh, pretty much all the red stars games uh, however i can whether it's on my phone or or online, um, yeah. I, I I watch the Red Stars. I don't I don't watch too many of the other games, but the Red Stars are are you know they they hold a, a you know a big place in my heart and a team I'll always support and uh, I love watching and and you know just kind of rooting for. Them. When you announced your retirement from the national team, you didn't fully retire. You still left the door open for a possible return to the Red Stars. So I'm just curious. Was there any chance that you'd return to the Chicago Red Stars and keep playing, even though you had announced that you weren't going to be playing for the national team anymore? Yeah, um, yeah, that's the reason I kind of did it in two steps. I, I knew that um, you know, ending on a World Cup victory, I thought the time was right to, to retire from the national team, and, and I felt pretty confident about that. But I was a little bit less confident, of, you know, that the time was right about retiring from the Red Stars, and I didn't want to rush that decision. So that's why I did. I did actually retire from the national team and kind of left the door open for the Red Stars. And, and the more I thought about it, and the more I, you know, kind of tried to let my body recover and, and figure out if I had another year or so in me, um, it just kind of became clear that it was just the right time. <laughs> and that was that was probably a much harder decision for me than than retiring from the national team, to be honest with you, because of the relationships that I have uh, with everybody in that organization and, and all the friends I have still playing on the team. and uh, So it was a really tough decision and something that, um, gosh, I went back and forth with for weeks and weeks and, and finally just uh, made that decision. But, yeah, it was, it was on the table for sure. Why did you and Lauren Holiday retire on the same day? Because when Shannon Box and Abby Wambach retired and played in their last international game, they did it on separate days, but you two did it together. So was that something that was planned, or is that just how it worked out? Yeah, there was really nothing nothing to read into that. It was just um, we, uh, Shannon, uh, Lauren, and myself had kind of retired around the same time. Um, so we uh, were going to retire really on the same day, but the way it worked out, um, Shannon is from the West Coast, and we ended up having a, a game out on the West Coast that her family could get to easy, easily, and then we ended up having another game that, that um, just worked out better for uh, Lauren Holiday and, and, and my family to get to. So that, that was all that, that, that really was. But, um, yeah, and again, I mean, I just talked about Tobin Heath, but I, I have to tell you, Lauren Holiday just an absolute class person and class player and um I, you know i can't speak highly enough about her yeah i was just curious about that not that i'm complaining you know i love both of you so <laughs> yeah. there's no i wasn't complaining i was just curious about that because they got their own days and you and lauren holiday shared a day so i was just curious yeah, about yeah, that yeah it's just kind of the way it works yeah. i guess did anyone try to talk you out of retirement friends family teammates coaches anyone well, I had uh, Rory, Rory Dames, the coach of the Red Stars. Uh, he's, he's been on my case even up till recently. <laughs> but, but um, no, I think it's all, it's all in, in good fun, to tell you the truth. Um, but I, I think, 
you know, the national team is just a different kind of animal. I mean, to, to do that day in and day out, and you have to just be 100% committed, and it takes a lot of, it, it's your whole life, you know. So I think when I made that decision, nobody questioned that one. Uh, but to retire from the Red Stars, I had a couple, like even, you know, even my dad was kind of like, are you sure, you, you know, you could play one more year, you could, you know, just you stay in here for one more, you know. But mm-hmm. um, but no, I was pretty set in my ways, and, and I just felt, you know, it, it, you can't describe it, you just kind of like feel it within you that, it's just the right time, and I, I was—I felt that without any doubt. Was there anyone from your circle who could have talked you out of retiring? Was there anyone who, had they come to you and said, "Play a few more years. You got a few more years in you. Just keep playing. You would have done it." Is there anyone who, had they come to you and said, "Go for another Olympic gold medal. Play in another Olympics, and then you can retire"? Is there anyone from your support system who, had they said, "Keep playing," you would have listened to and decided not to retire? Truthfully, I don't think so. I think I was just, like I said, I mean, it was just, and, you know, I think it was not only my mind telling me that it was the right time, but my body was telling me that, that it was the right time, and I've had uh, some back issues that I've been dealing with for years now, and, you know, that kind of, that kind of helped almost make the decision that, you know, it's not just, it's not just my mind, but really it's just, I don't think I can physically do it another year. Um, but, no, I don't think there's anybody that could have changed my mind, to tell you the truth. You got out at the perfect time. You went out on top as a world champion. It was the perfect time for you to retire. But I'm interested in knowing, had you not won the World Cup or had you not made it back to the national team, would you still be playing? Like, How closely related is winning the World Cup to you retiring? You know what? That's a really good question. I don't know if I've ever really put a whole lot of thought into that. Um, Yeah, it kind of... it was. It was um, so clear, you know, it's the way that it worked out with uh, winning the World Cup and all that stuff. It was just the perfect kind of period on the career. Um, I don't know. Had, I, had we not won or had I not gotten back on, on the national team, gosh, who knows? Maybe I would have been itching to, to go to one more Olympics or uh, to play another year with the, in the NW. I don't know. That's a good question. 2015 was an amazing year for you. You won the World Cup. You earned your 100th cap, you scored a goal in your hometown against New Zealand, and you were named the future head coach at Maryville University. Is it fair to say that 2015 was the best year of your life? <laughs> um, yeah, I would say so. There's a, there was a lot, of good, a lot of good that happened in 2015, um, and hopefully even, even more to come, but uh, yeah, I mean, when you think back to, uh, and even just the whirlwind of trying to get back on the national team and, and the emotions that went into the ups and downs of, of all that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, 15 was a pretty good year, and I'm excited about, I'm excited about the future. I've always been fascinated by your career for multiple reasons, but one of the reasons I've been fascinated with your career is the fact that you were away from the national team for five years, and in that five-year time period, you never stopped playing. You weren't being cleared by the national team, but you were still able to play for other teams, whether you were playing for the team out in Sweden or St. Louis Athletica or Chicago Red Stars. You never stopped playing in that time period. I've always thought that that was kind of strange that you weren't being cleared by the national team, but you were being cleared by these other teams and playing at a very high level. And some would say that you were playing at an even higher level than people who were on the national team during that five-year period. So I've always been fascinated by your career because of that. So I'm interested in knowing, why did it take so long? Why did it take five years for the national team to bring you back? Well, you know, I think, um, I don't know if I have a real clear-cut answer on that. Uh, I wish it wouldn't have taken them so long. (laughs) (laughs) But I think uh, concussions are such, you know, we're learning so much day by day. uh, And I think at the time, they were pretty certain that, um, that I shouldn't be playing anymore, and that was kind of just, you know, they didn't waver in what they felt was best for me, and, and I can respect that. Um, but I think, you know, as time went on and I, I was able to play concussion-free and um, kind of figure out how to continue to play at a high level, um, they probably, you know, kind of thought, well, 
maybe we could give this another shot. And um, I don't know what you know. I don't know what it was about the five year mark. I don't know if that was significant in any way or um, or what. But yeah, that that um, was pretty pretty uh, shocking to get the call that they were willing to to work with me again and, and try and figure things out and and get to the bottom of the whole concussion issue. But um, but yeah, I don't know if I have a clear cut answer other than I was you know shocked and and thrilled to get the call. At any point, did you think that they would never bring you back? Yeah, I played for pretty much all all of the five years, thinking that um, that they wouldn't bring me back. I think uh, in order for me to stay sane, I just had to kind of cope with the fact that I wasn't going to play on the national team anymore. But that never stopped me from wanting to be the best player that I could be, um, and to, you know, to try and continue to grow as a player. Uh, and you know, luckily that kind of led to the the opportunity to play with the national team again. But um, but yeah, it was definitely kind of out of sight, out of mind, uh, and that's just the way I had to approach it. If if I got up every day waiting for that call, I would be disappointed too often. You know, so mm-hmm. um, I just didn't let that get in the way of of me trying to be the best player that I could be for for the club teams that I was playing on. Had you not made it back to the national team, would you have been at peace, or would that have bothered you? I think I, I think I absolutely would have been at peace. I think I, I was at peace um, with uh, the deci- with their decision, um, and you know I was really enjoying playing and enjoying playing on the Red Stars and the various teams that I played on. And and um, like I said, it was kind of um, I had I had kind of moved on in a way and just uh, really appreciated the, the you know kind of the uh, second chance that I got at um, a career. Uh, because for a while there, I really thought that I wasn't going to be able to play soccer anymore um, on any team in any capacity. So, uh, so I was just enjoying playing and kind of didn't didn't really, uh, you know, I've always been taught to control the things you can control, and that was out of my control. So I just I didn't worry about it. I just kind of went on and played and, and uh, did the best I could. Was winning the World Cup everything you expected it to be? Because obviously... You played in the World Cup before. You played in the 07 World Cup, so you had that experience. And I'm sure when you were a kid growing up, you dreamed about what it would be like to win a World Cup. So did the dream and the reality of winning a World Cup, did those match up? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Um, I think it probably exceeded my expectations. Um, And even though I didn't, you know, get to contribute on the field as much as I would have liked to, the experience of being there and being there with your teammates and and then especially the way that the final went, um, you know, (laughs) we were celebrating on the bench for for the last, you know, 30 minutes at least and just couldn't wait to to, uh, run out on the field and, and just the aftermath of, you know, getting to travel around the country and and um, meet fans and people who who we had inspired, and you know, just getting to hear these stories, it was just incredible. And and really, the the um, the journey continues. You know, I still hear stories of people who were watching the games and who you know, young kids who you know have the the U.S. soccer jerseys on and and uh, found so much joy in watching the team win. It's, it's an it's an incredible feeling. And yeah, I mean, I think it it absolutely lived up to the expectations. After winning the World Cup, you were everywhere. Ticker tape parades, the White House, award shows, throwing out the first pitch at baseball games, and on stage with Taylor Swift. (laughs) Out of all the things you got to do, what was the best thing you got to do because you won the World Cup? Oh my gosh, it's hard hard to say just one thing. It was like, it felt like... It felt like one day, you know. It was like all of a sudden we woke up and we were world champions, and and we were getting to have all these incredible experiences. But I have to say, I'm going to narrow it down to one like 24 hour period, and that was the the, the day of the ticker tape parade, uh, where we got to go at, uh, on Good Morning America in the morning. We went to the ticker tape parade, which was outside of I mean my wildest imagination. Um, and then Taylor Swift at night. So that's like a pretty solid day right there. I'd agree. (laughs) I know you're a diehard St. Louis Cardinal fan, so when you were throwing out the first pitch at that Cubs game, did you feel a little dirty wearing the Chicago Cubs jersey and hat when you were throwing out that first pitch? I felt a little bit weird putting the jersey on and putting the, the Cubs hat on. Like, I, you know, I kind of felt like, it, you know, it was burning my back a little bit, <laughs> that jersey on. Uh, but that was an incredible experience. I mean, 
even even the most diehard Cardinal fans have to agree that Wrigley Field is a pretty special place. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was it was neat. It was it was really cool. Although I couldn't wait to get my Cardinal red back on. Now it just might be my ears are playing tricks on me, but when you were singing during the seventh inning stretch at that game, I've gone back and I've watched the video a dozen times, and I'm not real sure. I can't really tell, but it seems like when you get to the part in the song where it goes, root, root, root for the Cubbies, you stop singing, and you let Julie Johnston and Kristen Press take over during that part. Can you confirm for us, did you stop singing during that part in that song? Because I can't really tell 100%, so I want to hear it from you. Did you stop singing during that part? I just might have. I, I don't know. I, you know, it slips in my mind. I can't remember. <laughs> Why didn't the St. Louis Cardinals bring you back and have you throw out the first pitch? Because I know when you were playing for St. Louis Athletica in 09, they let you throw out the first pitch. Is there like a rule that once you do it once, they retire you and they never let you do it again? How come they didn't bring you back? I don't know. I guess I just did so well the first time that, you know, they didn't want to, they wanted to just stop right there. Right. But I'm so I'm waiting. I'm waiting on the call. I I I'll be there. I'll be there tomorrow if they if they want me. Right. right. They got to bring you back. They and I do have to I have to admit that, you know, I threw out the first pitch of the Cubs game and look how well they're doing now. So, sure. um, I think the Cardinals would be well served to have me come. Yeah, for sure. Definitely <laughs> a connection. How come at the White Sox game they only let Kristen Press throw out the first pitch because at the Cubs game they let all three of you throw out the first pitch? How come the White Sox couldn't do the same thing? Yeah, I don't know. We did the White Sox first and they and they just had the one uh, person throw out the first pitch and then we went to the Cubs and they had three pitchers out there for, you know, we all threw at the same time which was really cool. Um, but I don't know. I guess we didn't, we didn't even know it was an option to have three, three players throw at the same time. But, um, but I was glad that we, got to, that we got to do that. What's the first thing you think of when you think about your soccer career? What's the first thing that pops into your mind? Um, gosh, I don't know. I, probably I think back to being a youth player here in St. Louis and um, just how much fun I always had playing, like playing with my with my uh, grade school classmates at at uh, recess and like you know I, I I think back to I think the early memories and and um, the reason I started playing in the first place is uh, just the love of the game and, and how much I enjoyed playing um, when when we weren't playing for a gold medal you know that we were just playing for for bragging rights at recess um, I think those are some of the fondest memories I have. When did you realize you had the talent to be a pro and what event made you realize it? Um, hmm. well, I think it had to be around, um, around high school age, I guess. Uh, when I was, I think a junior in high school, I actually got called, uh, to play with the national team for the first time, uh, totally out of the blue. I mean, I, I played on some youth national teams, but I didn't know I was that good. <laughs> you know, I just kind of went along with the ride. Uh, but when I got the call up to, as a, I think a 17 year old to play with the national team, I was like, Okay, like this isn't typical. You know, this is kind of abnormal. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm good. <laughs> maybe I can go somewhere with this. Um, and that, you know, I kind of remember around that age thinking, okay, soccer is going to be my thing. That's that's what I'm going to do. At what point during your career did you say to yourself, "I made it"? Oh, um, I don't. I think that it's the nature of the beast is that you never think you made it. Um, I mean, I remember, you know, at, at a certain point, I was I was named a co-captain of the national team, and I still felt like if I don't play well today, I could be benched tomorrow. I could be off of the team the next day. You know, it was mm-hmm. constantly having to prove yourself over and over and over again. I think if you ever got complacent enough that you felt that that you were secure or that you had done a good job, you were probably on the way out because <laughs> mm-hmm. you, you know you can't ever get complacent. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I don't think I don't think there was ever even at the height of my career did I feel uh like okay, I'm good. I'm good. I made it, you know. Right. Just right. always trying to get better and improve on on little things. You've scored a ton of memorable goals during your career. Some people would say the most memorable goal you've scored was the goal you scored in St. Louis against New Zealand because it recently happened. So some people would say that's your most memorable goal. Some people would say the goal you scored 
against Japan in the 2008 Olympic semifinal game, that would be your most memorable goal. Some people would say that the goal you scored against Nigeria in the 07 World Cup is your most memorable goal because it was one of the fastest goals in the history of that tournament. Some people would say that that's your most memorable goal, but the goal I think of when I think about your career is the goal you scored back in May of 2007 in a friendly against Canada And it's a fantastic goal that you scored. I remember it like it happened today. It's an amazing goal. Erin McLeod, the goalkeeper for Canada, came way out. She was like at the 12 or 13. I don't know exactly what she was trying to do, whether she was trying to punch the ball out or catch it in the air cleanly. I don't know exactly what she was trying to do, but somehow the ball made its way to you, and without any wasted motion, without any hesitation, you send this this perfect shot, a left-footed shot, perfect speed, perfect accuracy, perfect touch, and drop the ball right over Aaron McLeod's head, who was trying to make it back to the net. This shot that you sent was a perfect shot. It was amazing. I was always blown away by that goal that you scored. So that's my most memorable goal for you. But what do you think? What do you consider your most memorable goal? Um... Well, I certainly remember that one. I could tell you, like we we were wearing pink. It was right. a cancer awareness game. Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember, I remember uh, a lot about that one. But um, I think, um, I mean, one of the two that you mentioned, um, and, and the one is the goal here in St. Louis, uh, which was, I mean, honestly, one of the best moments of my entire career. It just was such a full circle, like being in St. Louis with family and friends. Um, and, you know, getting to play at Bush Stadium, <laughs> where I've, you know, watched countless number of games and, and to score a goal, like, I just knew that my family's up in the stands crying and so excited, you know, it was kind of, uh, an emotional game for me. So that was one that I definitely will remember. And, of course, the, the goal against Japan was probably the biggest goal of my career for sure. Um, but, but Bush Stadium might just have eclipsed it a little bit in terms of, being meaningful for myself. At what point in time did we see the best version of Lori Kalupny out on the pitch? Well, I think um, I think my best playing years were probably right around the Olympics in 2008, 2008, 2009. Um, I was really just feeling, you know, confident. I was starting to, I played outside back now for a year or so, um, so I was starting to feel confident in that position and um you know you just i kind of i felt good going into every game that that I, nobody was going to get by me and that i could contribute offensively as well and i kind of i felt um during that little span that that uh that was probably the most confident i felt and uh uh in in both my defense and attacking game what do you consider the best moment of your soccer career um Best moment was I, I have to say uh, standing on the podium uh, in 2008 after we won the Olympics. Um, you know, there's just there's just no greater feeling than to hear your national anthem being played and and uh, to have been a big contributor on the field during that tournament. Um, I actually got hurt in the first game and was able to come back and finish the tournament and missed and missed um, the second game. I was able to come back for the for the, the, the rest of the tournament. So it was kind of the ups and downs. Um, you know, as a team, we had lost the first game. So the rest of the tournament was a do or die. And we had, you know, a lot of a lot of naysayers and a lot of people that, you know, didn't think we could do it. And we banded together and just got it done as a team. And it was probably one of the closest teams I've ever played on. And uh, and then to top it off, like I said, there's just there's just no greater feeling than, than, uh, than hearing your national anthem being played. Was the plan always to get into coaching after your playing career was over? Yeah, um, for for a long time I've kind of been uh, doing some uh, some some coaching on the side. Uh, I've gotten some done some coaching education courses and uh, kind of wanted to see if that was the direction I wanted to go and and uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, to me, like soccer has been such a big part of my life. I, I'm, you know, didn't just play soccer. I've, I always watch soccer. I play soccer, like every single second that I could possibly play soccer. I could never get enough. And um, 
you know, to, to be able to play for as long as I was able to. But, but now, you know, I don't have to leave the soccer field. I can still, still do, uh, still do what I've been doing the full time, which is, you know, uh, share my passion for the game and, and, uh, continue to touch the ball every day. <laughs> pretty, it's a pretty sweet life. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Eric Delabar is the head coach at Maryville University, and he also was your first soccer coach. And I know the last couple of years you've coached as an assistant under him. I'm just curious, have you two always remained in contact from when you played for him to when he hired you as an assistant? Yeah, we've been we've we've kept in touch all along. Uh, there's been fans that we haven't spoken for a while, but like we've always been we've always been been good friends. He has a camp. Uh, that he does every summer that I actually participated in as a youngster. So I always come back and, and uh, you know, talk to the campers. And, and so we've always kept in touch, and and uh, he's he's been a great supporter of me throughout my career. Because you're taking over as head coach in 2018, will your role with the team be expanding? And if so, in what way? Um, yeah, I think that's kind of the plan. It's really an awesome scenario uh, that I get to kind of learn from Eric over the next two years and, and take over things gradually uh, so that in two years I won't just be thrown to the wolves. I'll, I'll kind of be prepared and, and have gotten um, uh, a little bit more responsibility every year. Um, so I, I think that's the plan. And, I mean, it, it might not work for everybody, but this is – I am just feel so fortunate to, to have um, things work out this way. Uh, and, and I love working – for Eric and and he's um he's just been such a great mentor and like we get along so well it's just it's so much fun around the office and uh, I mean it's 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 awesome. Do you already have the plan in your head for what you want to do with the program when you take over, or are you not thinking about that yet? I think as a coach, you always look ahead um, because you know how how quickly time goes by, and mm-hmm. and you're always looking, you know, well, what 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 about when this class graduates? What about when this class graduates? You know, what are we going to have to mm-hmm. replace, and how are we going to have to change the the system? So I think you're always looking ahead. Um, it's kind of funny when I catch myself sometimes, like when I'm thinking two years from now, and I'm like, well, I'm going to be the head coach then. That's that's crazy. Mm-hmm. That just sounds weird. Um, but I think for the most part, it's going to be about continuing what we've got going. I think um, it's it's awesome working at Maryville because um, this team has grown so much over the past couple of years, uh, and I'm just I, I think we're going in a great direction. And I don't think we'll have to change much. I think it's just going to continue to to improve over the next couple of years. How would you describe your coaching style? Well, I firmly believe that if players are having fun, they're going to they're going to play their best and they're going to give you uh, the best effort. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, firm about certain things like um, certain discipline type things um, as I was as a player. Uh, the things you can control, your fitness, your attitude, um, your coachability, those kind of things I have, I have very little patience for. <laughs> so, uh, but I think on the, on the flip side, the learning of the game um, is, you know, I really enjoy teaching those aspects of of um, enjoy the game um, and kind of learn through the game. Like like the coaches don't have to have a perfect um, you know a perfect training session that's going to take you you know from step to step to step. Just play the game. The game is awesome. The game will teach. And if you're having fun, you're gonna you're gonna learn and, and uh, you're gonna work hard. Is college the level you want to stay coaching at, or are you interested in coaching at an even higher level, say the pro or national team level? Um, right now, I'm really happy in college. Who knows what the future will hold? I'm definitely not opposed to coaching uh, a, a pro team or even a national team at some point in my career. Um, I think that would be awesome. Um, but right now, I'm, I'm really happy to be home, to be back here in St. Louis, and to, to be coaching um uh, right here in my hometown. Earlier this year, you got engaged. Have you set a date for the wedding? Yeah, we have next about a year, uh, next June. So we've got a, we've got a little time to plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have you decided who the bridesmaids will be? And if so, will there be anyone from soccer that we know? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, my sister is one, and and the three others are all players that. Uh, that I've played with, actually two former Red Stars, 
Um, so, you know, like, like I was saying before, the Red Stars have a special place in my heart because of, of all the awesome people that I've met through the organization. And, and uh, yeah, so two, two former Red Stars in my, in my bridal party. We need names. <laughs> well, you'll see in about a year. Ooh, leaving us on the cliffhanger of all cliffhangers. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Is the theme of the wedding going to be unity, strength, attitude, in it to win it? <laughs> yeah, so we're going to do the cheer. <laughs> like uh, every time somebody you know hits the hits their glass, we just have to come together and do the do the unity, strength, attitude. That's that's the way it's going to go. <laughs> <laughs> After the wedding, will you still be Lori Kalupny? Professionally, or will you change your last name to your fiance's name? Well, you're really getting into the hard hitting questions now. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, well, I will definitely, um, I'm definitely going to change my name, but I think professionally I'll, I'll be more Colopney for a while. Speaking of names, how many nicknames do you have? You have Chalupa, Chups, Chupa. How many nicknames do you have, and do you have a favorite? I think uh, all the different variations on my last name, uh, it started with Chalupa, and then it was shortened to Chupa, and then Chups, and then, you know, I think it's that's all uh, kind of on the same on the same wavelength, but I don't know. Um, I don't care, <laughs> honestly. Just, as long as it's something nice, you can call me anything you want. <laughs> this story is a very famous story, and it's a story that a lot of people enjoy hearing, but... I can't really tell if you two are joking or if this is a real story. It's the story about you breaking your hand on Heather O'Reilly's abs. Everyone on the national team seems to have a very good sense of humor, and I can't really tell if this is a serious story or if this is a joke. So let us in on the gag. Is this a true story? Did you really break your hand on Heather O'Reilly's abs, or is this something where... It was a pre-existing injury. You went into the game with a hurt hand, and you decided to suck it up and play through it, and and you just brushed her by her abs or whatever, and that's how the hand got broken. It wasn't based on that. It was based on a pre-existing injury, and when you got into that game, it just was at the right angle at the right time, and that's what caused it to break? Like, was this a pre-existing injury, or did the injury happen exactly how it's told in the story? This actually, like, you can't make stuff like this up. I mean, this is how it actually (laughs) happened. I had no pre-existing injury, nothing. I mean, how it is on the YouTube video is exactly how it happened. (laughs) (laughs) She just has rock-hard abs, what can Mm -hmm. we say? (laughs) Last question, Lori, and this might be a very difficult question for you to answer because you haven't even been retired for a year, but what do you think your legacy is? What do you think is the mark you've left on the game? Oh, wow. Um, gosh, I don't even know how to answer that one. Um, I, You know, I think, uh, man, with the national team, I, I, I was kind of, I think, I was actually kind of fortunate enough to come along at the time when um, it was outside backs, uh, the role was really changing into becoming a a player who could play in the attack as well and not just be a defender but also aid in the the attack. Um, And so I guess, um, you know, I was kind of like one of the first in that generation of of that new type of attacking outside back. Um, So I think that's maybe a part of the legacy that I leave with the national team is as being an attacking style outside back, um, that was kind of a new a new thing for the national team at that time. Um, but uh, you know, I think uh, I don't know. It's it's hard for me to say. <laughs> I'll have to wait and see what everybody else says, and then, and then I'll come back and let you know. Hope Solo always said that she thought you were the best left back in the world. Some people have called you a trendsetter, a game changer. Anson Dorrance, your head coach in college, said you're one of the best three players he's ever coached, and he can't rank the top three players he coached because he says it's too difficult because nothing separates the top three players that he's coached. So I'd say that's a pretty good legacy right there. Yeah, that, that's um, I've heard that one before, and, and uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty meaningful for him to say. 
Lori, thank you for taking the time to talk. I really appreciate it. And congratulations, not just for having your number retired by the Chicago Red Stars on July 30th, but also for an amazing career. Thank you very much.